Hi everybody, Michelle Lyons back with you again. I'm delighted to have one of my esteemed and learned colleagues and friends, Owen O'Connor, here to talk about shoulder dysfunction. Now, everybody knows that my main interest is, is south of the border in terms of pelvic health, but nothing happens in isolation in the body. And I was doing some research on the new menopause course that Jenny Burrell and I are co-creating, and I came across an article from last year in the Physio Journal about the 50-year-old shoulder. And it was quite an interesting article uh, to me for a number of reasons, but primarily because it looked at how women in their 50s are at an increased risk of shoulder dysfunction, that there are influences, you know, from thyroid dysfunction and, of course, hormonal fluctuations in the perimenopausal uh, changeover are going to be a player as well. So um, when you want clear water, you go to the head of the fountain. So I reached out to Owen and asked him if he would share his wisdom and insights with us about shoulder dysfunction, uh, particularly in women in and around menopause. So Owen, thank you again for coming on to have this chat. You're and welcome, delighted to be here. If you wouldn't mind just introducing yourself and a little bit about where you're coming from and where you're based. Okay, uh, my name is Owen O'Connor. I'm a physiotherapist specializing in upper limb and shoulder problems. I work at a practice uh, called Evidence-Based Therapy Centre in Galway. Um, I'm the co-owner, co-director with um, my wife, Roisin Joyce, who's a clinical psychologist. So we have a multidisciplinary practice. Lovely. Great. And shoulders have really, you know, I sound a bit like Magnus Magnuson, but shoulders are really your, your specialist topic, aren't they? I mean, you, you've, been, you've had a, a deep interest in shoulder function and dysfunction, I suppose, for quite a while. Yeah, so I suppose I, I spent the first half of my career, I'm, I'm, I'm 20 years qualified this year, so I suppose I spent the first half of my career um, working in, you know, developing my broad general skills, doing my rotations, um, becoming a musculoskeletal physiotherapist, and, um, you know, doing some sports, high level elite and sub elite. And, and I suppose when I start, when I went back and did my master's at University of Birmingham in uh, advanced practice physiotherapist physiotherapy I really felt the need to go back to the NHS um, and I was working in the UK at the time and going back to the NHS at the time was a really exciting exciting time really there was a there was a lot of money coming physiotherapy's way mm -hmm. the development of extended scope practitioner physiotherapists at the, as it was called at the time or mm -hmm. advanced practitioners and I really developed my interest in shoulders and, and had huge opportunity I suppose to specialize in shoulder and upper limb dysfunction. Um, you know, it was a time when the funding was trying to reduce orthopedic waiting lists yeah. and to develop specialist physiotherapy practitioners who could order MRI scans and, you know, interpret MRI scans, do injections, um, do ultrasound guided injections. And um, it, was, it was just a great opportunity to work with some really, really good people and get some great training. Um, so uh, it, it kind of, flew from there really um, and it, the, the next kind of phase was that all of the funding was moving towards primary care in the UK no. trying to you know reduce um, the, the the load or the burden of acute hospitals who are which are very expensive so my, my next stop was a primary care trust in in London and we could develop specialist streams of care specialist physiotherapists and had fantastic opportunity to work with some some really great people so i suppose for the past 10 years or so i've been working almost solely in shoulder and, and upper limb with mm. other tangential interests as well in you know education and teaching and um, pelvic health as well will be a, an interest a side interest of mine uh, particularly working with women's and men's health physiotherapists um, chronic pain. Um, so all, all of these aspects, I think, will be you know central to my daily practice. Um, Fantastic. And I think you know that's it's really interesting because you know I look at your social media output and I've seen uh, both you know some of the reviews for the courses that you teach and there's such a strong emphasis on moving away from just isolated, as I said, three sets of ten with the green theraband to maybe looking at the whole person, you know, much in the same way that, you know, I'm, I'm fond of saying that there is a person attached to the vagina, you know, when we're talking about <laughs> pelvic health, that there is actually a person attached to the shoulder as well. And you've got to look at the whole person. Um, if we look at the 50 year old shoulder, why do you think that we, we start to see a bit of an increase in shoulder dysfunction, whether we're talking about frozen shoulders or 
or biceps dysfunction. Biceps tendinopathy seem to be quite a hot topic at the minute in, in the shoulder world. Um, why is it just, is it aging? Is it that old chestnut wear and tear or what's your perspective? Okay, so I think if we take the two most prevalent, the two most common shoulder problems that present, um, probably about 50% of people with shoulder pain coming to see a physiotherapist will have some problem with their rotator cuff. Mm -hmm. um, and the rotator cuff, you could include biceps as well in, in terms of that entire, entire complex. So they would probably have tendon problems. Mm -hmm. Perhaps 10 to 20% of people coming to see a physiotherapist with shoulder pain will have frozen shoulder. Okay. Now, if we think about the epidemiological studies looking at both of these conditions, so frozen shoulder, a peak age of 52, um, and usually you see it between the ages of 49 and 62 or so. Okay. So we're, we're looking at that age, you know, that 50s, in your 50s bracket. And then the tendinopathy zone. <laughs> we, we, we all know that really after about the age of 40 or 45, we get significant changes, age-related changes, normal age-related changes in the collagen in the tendons. Sure. You know, we get type 1 collagen fibers that become replaced by type 3 collagen fibers and maybe some fatty infiltration and maybe some small little anomalies, intra-substance anomalies. And these, these generally progress. This is a normal progression um, from the mid-40s onwards. So I suppose by the 50s, we have in the rotator cuff, we have some significant weaknesses or you know, areas of structural weakness that leave that person a little bit more susceptible to pain or injury. And then so we is, have... Is it inevitable, Owen? That we're going to end up with problems in our 50s you know with our shoulders is it just the way of the world or I, I think it is inevitable that there will be structural changes okay. in, in the shoulder yeah. um, whether they uh, become painful or not is dependent on lots of different factors that's a really key point, I think, because sometimes I think in the past, hasn't there, there's been a lot of emphasis on maybe decompression surgeries, you know, subacromial imp impingement. Um, but do you feel that that's maybe, you know, kind of a mirror situation in the past, you know, where everybody was having imaging done of their lumbar spine? Oh, look, there's the disc. That's the problem. Do you think yeah. there's any sort of a parallel there? Oh, huge, huge parallel. Okay. Um, you know, I think we have to very carefully evaluate whether or not a structural problem in a tendon actually relates to symptoms. And the, the most important thing is the patient in front of you and the clinical symptoms that they present with. We could take 100 people, put them into the MRI scanner, look at the rotator cuffs. If they're age 50, they probably have about a 50% chance of having a, a, some sort of a tear in the rotator cuff mm. if they are asymptomatic. Wow. You're twice as likely to not have symptoms and have a rotator cuff tear and to have symptoms. So interesting, isn't it? Yeah, it, re it really is, it really is interesting. And I think there are so many different factors that can make somebody symptomatic or not. You know, we have mechanical factors. How much are you loading your shoulder? You okay. know, tendons, you know, I say this all the time. I think it's a, a phrase that I've, I've stolen from Jeremy Lewis, but tendons don't like change. So, <laughs> I'm fond of saying that about bowels, but you know, <laughs> tendons as well, tendons and bowels. They're creatures of habit. Yeah, so sudden increases in load, sudden increases in activity, or sudden decreases in activity can make the tendon much more susceptible to developing pain. Interesting. And I think, you know, maybe in, in perimenopause as well, because of, you know, I think, you know, estrogen is responsible for so many different changes. Um, you know, I think it's got about 400 different functions in the female body. And certainly there is some, there's not a huge amount of, of literature about it, but we do see estrogen having a role to play in that collagen turnover that yeah. you were talking about. And maybe in that, the, you know, the, the, the tendency maybe for degeneration in the, in the tendons. But I think as well for a lot of women in that 50s age range as well, um, because of changes with their metabolic rate and maybe increased weight gain, it, it can often be a time when new exercise is embraced and maybe that could be possibly a link as well, do you think, if somebody is going too hard, too fast, too soon with a new activity, that that could be provocative? Absolutely, absolutely. Something new and unusual and different okay. is, 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 is often the trigger for developing of shoulder pain. So you might have a tendon that has some structural changes, but it's quite happy with the level of activity that's going on, and then a sudden increase. Um, 
you know in that activity can bring about bring about the pain but there can be there can be lots of other factors as well not 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 just exercise i mean mm. if we look at the risk factors for tendinopathy they're mm. very similar to the risk factors for cardiovascular problems interesting um, you know so smoking diabetes the amount of general exercise cardiovascular problems mm. um, all of these things di you know diabetes is a is the biggie really and if we we, if we think about the nutrition to the tendon being delivered to this little microvasculature of of, of uh, blood vessels um, anything that compromises that uh, you know that that blood flow to the tendon can reduce its ability to regenerate and you know um, respond well to exercise yeah. and again possibly estrogen having a role there as well because of its role in in vascular um, flexibility I suppose as well as, as everything else Oh, is, is shoulder pain always driven by the shoulder? Um, no, absolutely not. <laughs> absolutely not. Um, How does it play, do you think? You know, I think we often have shoulder pain referring from the neck. Um, yeah. I think a really good history is mm -hmm. often the best way of trying to identify whether or not the pain is coming from the neck or the shoulder. It's probably more powerful, you know, than, than, than specific clearing tests and and things yeah. like that um you know and i i, I suppose developing our prat pattern recognition skills in terms of okay what is the patient telling us yeah. that is aggravating their pain you know is is so so important you know that that old phrase of you know listen very very carefully to the patient and they will tell you what's wrong with them really comes into play here you know so so i think that that can really help us if we're you know on a you know on a basic level if we're thinking about movements of you know the neck rotation or sitting you know still for long periods of time mm -hmm. things like that we'd often be more thinking about neck you know for the shoulder i'm, I'm really thinking about activities where you raise your arm above 90 degrees mm -hmm. um, holding the hair dryer or the straightener is the, the the big one um you know tying up the hair things like that um, re repetitive activities a uh, big one for frozen shoulder i always ask about is you know turning off the bedside light if that that light is on the side of your bed or if you've got a right frozen shoulder and you're driving into the car park in ireland or england uh, the the ticket machine is on your right and lifting your arm into that position abduction and external rotation position okay. often frozen shoulders just cannot do that they have to get out of the car they're the annoying person in right. front of you has to get out of the car and use their other arm so have sympathy <laughs> be nice <laughs> yeah. yes. um for women, you know, um, one of the modules that we're working on in this third age course, um, I just did an interview with one of our physio colleagues, Siobhan O'Donnell down in Cork, and we were talking about the importance um, at menopause, particularly for any stage of a woman's life, but the importance of wearing a well-fitted bra, because if you're not getting adequate breast support when you're exercising, I think, you know, the, the tendency can be to go into a lot of, you know, protraction, internal rotation, adduction, um, and as well as that, it's going to limit some of your thoracic extension mobility in general. Um, do you find that's a player with shoulder pain? We were looking at it more, more from the point of view of ability to participate in exercise and thoracic movement, but could that be a driver for shoulder problems, do you think, as well? I think, yeah, I think it's more a driver for thoracic yeah. pain, um, yeah. in, in my personal experience. Yeah. If I was to think about shoulder, shoulder pain and shoulder problems, um, an, an, ag an aggravating factor, and um, with a, a poorly fitting bra uh, would probably be a chromioclavicular joint pain. Okay. So simply that strap um, coming directly over and being putting in and being very tight there can irritate and aggravate a current or an underlying chromioclavicular joint problem. Um, and so from a shoulder perspective, would you prefer to see a wider strap or even a little padding under the strap? Do you think, would, you know, have you found any helpful strategies for that? Yeah, definitely a wider strap in those in those people um, are simply going and getting a good a good bra fitting, or even a racer back bra. I would imagine that will just kind of offload that area entirely. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, and sports sports bras for uh, for the sporting activity um, are often much better supported and take the load off this area, of course. Right. Um, in terms of you know biopsychosocial approach is a huge huge buzzword in um, in the world of physio at the minute and rightly so. How do you feel stress and sleep and lifestyle, um, personality? How do you feel all those play into uh, shoulder problems? Um, I think they play into all musculoskeletal presentations and the, the impact 
you know, on, on, on that person and, you know, how, how they present. So I think all physiotherapy assessments really should take account of these, you know, every time we're, you know, we're quizzing them, um, you know, we'll go into it in some people more than others. Yeah. Maybe we'll screen people with specific questionnaires a little bit more, you know, if we're suspicious using things like the patient or the pain catastrophizing scale, the patient self-efficacy questionnaire, things like that can really help. Um, you know, sleep, huge, absolutely hugely important in terms because of... You can't of, sleep on that shoulder. Yes, absolutely. Um, I've got a cat jumping up on me here. <laughs> <laughs> <No>. <laughs> So yeah, I think, you know, I always ask about sleep and sometimes I just give a quick, can you give me a, a you know, a mark out of 10, how you're doing with sleep? Yeah. You know, 10 is, you know, perfect sleep, great. Eight, nine hours of sleep every night. Zero is not sleeping at all. Where are you on that scale? Yeah. You know, where, are you, where do you think you are in your nutrition? You know, how much are you, you know, where do you think you are in your general exercise? And just helping them to maybe identify some yeah. risk factors or some things that might be impacting upon the recovery or sometimes that simply just asking that allows you then to talk about it a bit more and address it a little bit more and find out what their true true problems are um so i think that again having the time to do a really full history like that to chat to them yeah to demonstrate to to really practice really true empathy you know not not just sitting there sympathizing with their with their symptoms and you know crying with them or whatever you know it, like actually true empathy where you're really thinking what what does this person in front of me need from me what can know? we do? Mm. do i need to do a much more general holistic you know program for this person help them to address some of their modifiable risk factors or are we going down a more traditional physiotherapy exercise mechanical type type route you know and trying to find what is the best thing for people sometimes people aren't ready for the more general lifestyle changes and yeah you, you, i suppose you get a sense for when you push that and when you, when you don't yeah do you feel that so you, nutrition and hydration is that something that you address with your with your shoulder patients um and are, are there any particular areas or is it just are you looking at kind of a broad overview I suppose I'm looking for a broad overview. Overview. I think I wouldn't want to stray too far into a nutritionist ter territory. I think you know we're. I'm, I'm not trying to do that. Mm. Um, I, I suppose as I've gotten more experienced and more specialist in frozen shoulder, um, you know, I really talk a little bit more about it with frozen shoulder. I suppose mm. and the, these types of risk factors. So if we think about you know the the incidence of frozen shoulder. Probably between one and five percent of people will get a frozen shoulder at some stage in their life. Right. Um, probably about twenty to thirty percent of diabetics will get a frozen shoulder. So we have this huge risk factor of diabetes and frozen shoulder. And I suppose as I'm becoming more experienced, I'm recognizing a, a real spectrum mm. of stiff shoulder. So on the milder end of the spectrum, people who might just have some end of range stiffness and restriction not a full-blown painful frozen shoulder but definitely mechanical restriction that's that's preventing them moving correctly and giving them some pain and then when you dig a little bit deeper they'll often have these other risk factors and i've started sending people more and more to the gp to have glucose tolerance testing and you know i, I kind of used this expression recently to a gp said they move a bit like a diabetic mm. you know they've got stiff shoulders they're stiff in their joints you know, they've got some other risk factors which might make you suspect diabetes. When I've asked them about their nutrition, you know, it hasn't been great. So they've got some abdominal, you know, additional abdominal fat that you're, that I'd be concerned about. Well, what do you think about doing a glucose tolerance test? And as I've done this a little bit more, I've become a bit more confident about chatting to GPs about this and chatting to patients about this and not just addressing the stiffness in their shoulder. Yeah. You know, I think I've uncovered more and more. And then the spectrum continues all the way through to people, you know, with very, very me mechanically restricted shoulders, huge pain and, and dysfunction in their shoulders. So that's just it. I mean, I think, you know, that, that old, you know, it's almost a cliche at this point, but nothing happens in isolation in our bodies, you know. Right. And I think, you know, I, I was looking at some of the research that uh, O'Sullivan quotes in this article. Um, even thyroid dysfunction uh, seems mm. to be linked to frozen shoulders. So I think, like you were saying, just to have that bit of a broad overview uh, with that, do you subscribe to the theory that most frozen shoulders are self-limiting 
and should just kind of be left to kind of freeze and melt and thaw by themselves <laughs> or, um, you know do we need to be a little bit more um gosh it's a very involved? miserable it's a very miserable painful condition to just allow the, the natural history of between 12 and 42 months as the, the biggest epidemiological study would show that it, it takes to resolve and really i think we've a, we've a big role not necessarily just as physio you know physiotherapy i think there's a, the spectrum so i will i will typically discuss five options with with my patients with their frozen shoulder and some of them are more um applicable at different stages you know so so we we could consider um no treatment or watchful waiting you know let's see what happens i would say one person every two years chooses that that i discuss with i think if we go from so least invasive to most invasive. Next, I would talk about physiotherapy. Mm -hmm. And physiotherapy is really good at getting back a range of motion in with a restricted frozen shoulder. But we know that in the very early stages of a very painful frozen shoulder, the physiotherapy is not particularly helpful. That one study would show that it's no better than supervised neglect, as, uh, <laughs> as it has been called. Um, and it probably just makes you know the patient, you know, in a lot of pain or yeah. really not like their physiotherapist. So I think when it's a very painful frozen shoulder, we'd probably consider a guided corticosteroid injection okay. um, in the joint. Um, and this would usually help with pain, help with night pain, help with pain at rest. It doesn't help with range of motion, but sets people up to be in a very good position to improve their range of motion. Mentally and physically, I would imagine. Exactly, with, yeah. with physiotherapy. And it's a surprising, I say to my patients, I say, well, when you have the injection, what typically happens is that you might get an increase in pain for one or two days. Then by day three, it's feeling kind of a little bit settled. By day seven, much better again. By day 10 to 14, much better again. Okay. Um, so it should feel much better in terms of pain and sleeping and lying on it, but you won't do any improvement in your range of motion. You'll still be at this point. Okay. They come back to me and they say, oh, exactly what you happened. You said happened to the pain and, you know, it feels much better. I'm sleeping through the night. I'm not, you know, it's not hurting when I'm sitting watching television. But my movement is much better. You said my movement wouldn't be much better. So I'm like, okay, well, we'll measure it. And when we measure the movement again, it's exactly the same. But yeah. they have the sensation that their movement is much better because it's so much more comfortable. It's easier, yeah. You know? yeah. Um, yeah. They don't like to pour, pour cold water on there fantastic result I this is, we still have quite a bit of work to do here yeah. in terms of, you know getting the movement back because really when most people are stuck at about 90 degrees mm. it's not great for you know tying up the ponytail or you know most 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 functions really um and then i i talk about more invasive options as well sometimes le less frequently these are ones that we go down so distension mm. where we guide a needle into the joint and, and and inject saline and stretch the capsule from the inside to help it return to something approaching its normal volume you know the the, the volume in a frozen shoulder is about three to five percent uh, three to five mils in a frozen shoulder as opposed to about 30 or 35 mils wow. in okay. shoulder. so if you inject 30 or 35 mils of saline into the capsule the idea is that you stretch it back to where where it was mm -hmm. so this can be really really helpful um for for some people as well um but not well tolerated in those early stages mm. i have to say um you know and then i you know manipulation under anesthetic is not something that i ever really recommend anymore um you know it's it, it's still still alive and well in the west of ireland oh, to, there. To <laughs> <laughs> um but it's, it's not done in the nhs anymore typically it's not done in australia anymore i think it's i think it's on its way out i think you know in terms of risk versus benefit for me it doesn't weigh up um, you know, with the, 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 the different risks in terms of fractures or neurovascular injuries and even just anaesthetic risks, you know, I, I wouldn't go down that route. Um, capsular release, release surgery is very effective. One, one of the surgeons that I worked with in, in London, uh, when he did his patient satisfaction questionnaires, um, capsular release surgery had the highest satisfaction of any of his operations, you know, which was a big surprise to me, but it, I think it shows the you know how difficult a condition frozen shoulder is for people's everyday life you know it's limiting. Yeah. Um, but but I, I i think capsule release is not really needed for most people okay. i think i think the less invasive things get people where they need to be I so think. would you see more people doing well with say, a combination of physio uh, plus or minus than the guided injections would you see that being where the bulk of recovery is going to happen 
absolutely absolutely yeah okay. um, i would say and and the way i usually what i usually see and what i usually describe yeah. is that you know with physiotherapy with or without an injection we typically get to about 80 or 90 percent better okay and then the last 10 to 20 percent is over time is yeah. you know they're fully functional usually they're up at you know 150 160 degrees and doing everything they need to do and then over time the changes in the capsule um you know that are that are common with frozen shoulder are the changes in the rotator interval or the coracohumeral ligament that are that are that are consistently found in frozen shoulder they will they will change gradually over time and go back to normal and they do they do go back to normal in most cases okay great in terms of physio strategies you know and bearing in mind individualizing treatment and everything do you do you feel there's a role for for manual therapy or modalities or are you looking primarily at an exercise based strategy with education for frozen shoulder yeah yeah um i don't see a role for modalities i do some small amount of, of manual therapy but it's really to demonstrate the level of stretching and mobilization that the yeah. that, that the patient should do at home. I think the half an hour that they spend with me in a treatment session pales in comparison to the other 23 and a half hours they have with themselves, yeah. <laughs> you know, in, in a day. They're the major factor here and getting, you know, helping them to, to have control of their condition really is the, the purpose of, of my session. Mm. Um, and I think, you know, the, the, the stretching techniques are, mobilization techniques that that we can use to improve the range of motion in frozen shoulder they need to be done regularly throughout the day they're not going to make any difference if you even do them once a day i think um you know it probably needs to be three times a day and that, and that's what i would explain explain to people uh, yeah i mean i think generally you know from from a tissue mobility point of view but i think also maybe from a, a neuroplasticity point of view as well just to keep reinforcing to the brain that it's okay to move in this range yeah yes um, is it okay to provoke pain yes. yes absolutely absolutely i think i spend a lot of time uh with my tendinopathy patients telling them okay we're allowed to have this small amount of pain maybe two out of ten three out of ten maybe four out of ten but we really don't want to go above that and you know talk about load and not overloading and cumulative load with frozen shoulder i i say listen it's okay to be painful you can't damage a frozen shoulder yeah yeah okay? we don't want it to be horrendously painful we don't want it to be awful and miserable and everything but to stretch this tight capsule which has lots of changes in cytokines and pain provoking cells in it, to stretch that it is bound to be painful yeah. um, and you know that there are some developments in frozen, frozen shoulder recently it's it's quite an exciting time for frozen shoulder i think and i'm looking at doing some research on it um in in the in the near future but I think one of the big developments was a couple of years ago, a, a study came out um, from Louise Holman, who's an Australian physiotherapist. Mm. She took a small amount of patients, six, six patients, who were about to have capsular release surgery. She measured their range of motion before they had the surgery okay. um, and before they had general anesthetic, their, their passive range of motion. And then she measured their passive range of motion after they had the general anesthetic, but before they had the surgery. And she found this huge difference. Oh. So in six out of the six patients that she had, their abduction range of motion imp improved from about 80 or 90 degrees to up to about 150 degrees. Wow. In, in, I think it was three or maybe four out of the six patients, the external rotation improved as well. So the conclusion is that the, the restriction of a frozen shoulder, mm. not purely a mechanical passive restriction from the capsule, there is a degree of muscle guarding involved. And this muscle guarding is probably unconscious or, you know, cortical right. in, in some level. So I've kind of taken this to another level where I'm kind of thinking, okay, how do we assess or how do we try and change yeah. you know, the, um, the, our check if there is muscle guarding? And there are lots of techniques around that, but, you know, exercising to a metronome using an external auditory oh, yeah. cue has been okay. shown in, in lots of studies and lots of areas of physiotherapy to be helpful mm. and helping with muscle relaxation or corticospinal inhibition. Sure. And this is, you know, it's a case study I recently wrote up and I, you know, I teach this method. But as part of my assessment, I will mobilize them to the beat of a metronome into external rotation and get them doing it. And if we get an almost immediate improvement, 
then it shows that there is an element of muscle guarding. And I see this, see this quite a lot. Even if we don't get a huge improvement, it mm-hmm. makes exercises more tolerable. Yeah. My patients tell me that they seem to two minutes of doing their exercise, you know, into external rotation goes much quicker. They seem to go into a kind of a trance like state where it doesn't feel as painful, you know? So I think your point about the central nervous system and the brain, mm. you know, we, uh, we have to think a little bit more like neurological physiotherapists in all of our areas of everything in everything musculoskeletal. We, yeah. the central nervous system is always playing a role it's always in charge yeah. you know at the end of the day so oh and just to kind of come back to that point so that would be a very interesting kind of top-down modification so with that in mind do you feel there's any role then for kind of a bottom-up approach of maybe heat or ice or anything like that from, from that sort of an input direction rather than actual tissue effects mm. Maybe, maybe. Yeah. I think probably, I probably heat. I think it's its primary um, driver in terms of improvement is neurological. I, oh, yeah. I think yeah. for, for this rather than any kind of tissue. There were some studies, early studies, that showed that if you heated up the the shoulder, that you got a more effective capsular stretch. But it was always it was always um, described in terms of heating the capsule and making it, you know. You know, able to tolerate a stretch more or more amenable to stretching it yeah. wasn't actually described as a, a central nervous system um driver so i i, th- I don't think the evidence is there right I think from my clinical practice i i don't tend to use modalities and things for frozen shoulder you know sometimes if it makes somebody more comfortable than i would i i, yeah. I suppose it's not really in my main uh, repertoire of things that i do no but i suppose anything that improves patient comfort and compliance you yes. know and that, that doesn't have any side effects you know you know if someone finds a hot shower soothing or sedative for their pain and they're more inclined to do their exercises afterwards there's no harm yes absolutely absolutely yes so do you subscribe then to the notion because kind of looking at a couple of the um the social media pundits in in the world of shoulder physio you know there seems to be a general consensus that you can't go wrong getting strong <laughs> so is there a focus um do you feel that's evidence based in terms of looking at rotator cuff strengthening and I, you know i realize that's kind of a two pronged question because i'm sure strategies will be different from a biceps tendinopathy versus rotator cuff frozen shoulder scenario yeah. so i'd love to hear your thoughts on that <laughs> broad <Okay>. broad topic <laughs> so i think i think some of the social media sound bites um are a little bit uh, black and white the, the my binary for my uh, my tastes really you know um so i i think the kind of you can't go wrong wrong getting strong or you know all manual therapy sucks and all those different things that just i don't know who you're talking about <laughs> yeah they're just for me i think there's something in a lot of what it is but it's just a little bit too too black and white we don't we don't live in this binary world um i think when we're talking about rotator cuff problems mm. um undoubtedly the most important factor in the treatment of rotator cuff tendon is gradual increasing the loading okay so softly softly nothing too aggressive yeah therefore gradually increasing the strength and the load that that tendon can tolerate so Mm -hmm. absolutely strengthening is a huge component um but if we look at the research you know it probably you know if you look at tendon research and we look at tendon loading uh, programs mm. you get very good results at 12 weeks or 18 weeks perhaps but not necessarily structural changes until we do very heavy loading oh. so heavy slow loading mm-hmm. and you know if we if we kind of stuck to the to the idea that the structural change is the thing that gives us the pain relief then we wouldn't expect any improvement in symptoms for 12 to 18 weeks wow. whereas most of my patients will feel some improvement at two to four weeks okay very low load modification of their general load in everyday activity and very low load progressive exercises so why is that i think we're coming back to the neurological system (laughs) you know so i think those early programs they're not pure strengthening yeah you know so loading that tendon little by little gently gently is i think like graded exposure of that tendon tendon to load you know, and allowing our our brain to become used to these movements again there's almost yeah. certainly tissue tissue changes going on there as well in terms of low low tolerance um and then as we move to the later stage of rehabilitation i certainly think that strength uh, has a massive role mm. prevention of recurrence 
not just getting somebody to be pain-free in a normal week, an everyday week, but to be pain-free for a busy week, a difficult week, for the when the sun shines and they want to go out in the garden and, you know, dig the garden and do their weeding they haven't done for ages or whatever, whatever it is, that they are, you know, their capacity is much higher than their kind of baseline average. And so I think you can't go wrong pushing on for high level strength at that stage. Okay. Um, and do you feel a combination of, you know, uh, concentric, isometric, eccentric? Is there any benefit for one approach versus the other? Or are you looking for uh, a combination? I think combination, functional strengthening is, is where I go. I tend to, I do tend to use some eccentric loading. I know the, the research would show that um, there's probably not, you know, the, the, be, the added benefit of just doing eccentric over concentric, eccentric that we thought. That was, originally. That was quite the trend in tendinopathies for a while, wasn't it? It was, it was. Um, but I still use it for certain yeah. things simply because it's less load. It's half the amount of load if you're just doing the downward movement. Sure. than the up and down movement and so i use it as a way of grading the improvement if somebody is very weak or somebody is progressing very slowly so i still i use a huge combination of different exercises i think really again coming back to finding out what that patient needs you know really listening to them what do they need what in their everyday function and tailoring the exercises to suit that and to improve their their everyday function and their main problems so going straight for the painful movements making them easier making them lower load, making them, you know, less difficult for them, making, making them less scary, you know, whether that's a lower weight than they would normally have or a smaller range of motion or a, an easier position to do it in, you know, lots of different modifications are available there. Fantastic. So do you feel, you know, I mean, do you have a favorite exercise strategy? I mean, do you, closed chain, open chain, paraband, kettlebells, or is it just, you know, based on the person who's in front of you? Or do you have like a couple of go-to uh, strengthening strategies that you use for shoulders? Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose I have a core group of exercises that are my favorites that I find useful. Early stages, maybe some isometric or closed chain exercises in, you know, on all fours can be really helpful for people who have high, high levels of pain sometimes. And it's a great way of loading the, 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 the rotator cuff muscles and the scapular muscles in a, in a safe, non-provocative way. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm not, I don't use much TheraBand, I have to say. Um, you know, I think supporting the, the, the arm and doing some rotator cuff loading with, with a, supporting the elbow on something and using a dumbbell, for yeah. me, is a really nice way of, you know, knowing how much load they're taking you know, with the weight, you know, starting from a one kilo and moving up gradually. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I think I would always want somebody who has a rotator cuff pain to be able to activate the rotator cuff all the way through range to their full available range, you know, so looking at what their full available range is mm -hmm. and trying to tailor an exercise to them. Um, you know, so yeah, yeah I, 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 I suppose I have a core group of exercises that I use, but I don't have, I'm not fixed on a program. There's no recipe. Unless it's with your massive, you know, the massive tears, mm. um, inoperable, full thickness, massive rotator cuff tears. Mm. I really, really love the Ainsworth program. Um, you know, that is, that is my go-to there, I suppose. Um, progressing somebody from supine uh, flexion movements to more upright and to standing it's just i think it's the beautiful simplicity exactly. you know really appeals to me and appeals to patients i think as well perfect um and i think as well you know just coming back to what you were saying about you know loaded maybe in supine it can actually be a great way of of maybe working on bone quality as well because you know like the head of the humerus and the neck of the humerus is actually one of the prime areas for women to develop osteoporotic fractures as well yes. so I suppose if we are kind of, you know, bringing it back to those women in their 50s again, we can't ignore that aspect of it as well, that, you know, strength training, resistance training is vital for, for bone health as well as muscle and, and tendon health too. So Absolutely. it's important to, to get women back, to get women strong, I suppose, yeah. through range. Yeah. Um, again, and, it, it all feeds into it to itself. And not being afraid of pushing on once they're out of pain and once, you know, we're out of the, the acute horrible phase, not being afraid to push people on, you know, and do, you know, planks and one arm planks and side planks. And, you know, I like the kind of bouncing 
you know, balls against, you know, gym yeah. balls against walls and, you know, like quite, quite heavy loaded because we need, we need all of this. We need to be able to push through our arms. We need to be able to do dynamic and ballistic movements, you know, slow controlled movements of the weight are a great way of starting off. But they're, they're not functional. They're absolutely not functional. We need to have those fast reactive movements yeah. in our repertoire as well. And in the more able people, we can have great fun with gym balls and doing, you know, you know, doing weight bearing exercises from gym balls and things, you know, it can really vary up the exercise program and have great fun. And, you know, it always brings a smile to people's faces. I think we have a, a bone builders class and as soon as the gym balls come out, people are, are smiling and really enjoying <laughs> it. That's, that's, a, that's a massive, massive yeah. bonus, I think. So, so yeah. they're, they're for more than just sitting on, basically, is what you're saying. Yes, definitely. Definitely. I think, and I think, Owen, though, that's an area that as physios, we've kind of let slide over the past couple of years, our, our diversity in terms of exercise prescription. So I think that's really important that maybe that's an area that we can look at that I think for a long time we, we went down looking for the, the rabbit hole, looking for the, the magic manual therapy technique for this and for this. And I think now we're starting to pull back a little bit and maybe taking a bigger overview. But I really think that exercise prescription is, is a huge area for us as professionals. I think we've lost our way a little bit and I'm glad to see, I think we're coming back a little bit more towards it again. Because I just think in every dimension, in terms of, of physical strength, but in, in terms of mental health as well, there are such benefits for exercise. So it's, it's great to see um, high level teachers and, and professionals like yourself really kind of embracing that spectrum of exercise availability that's out there for us. Oh, and I can't thank you enough, like clinical pearls all over the place uh, in this chat. Where can people find out about your shoulder courses and come and learn from the best? Okay, uh, thanks Michelle. Um, so I teach a shoulder masterclass. Um, uh, you can find all the details on my website www.ebtc.ie um, or you can follow me on Twitter. I'm pretty easy to find on Twitter at ebtc underscore Owen. Um, I've got a course coming up soon but I, I tend to run three or four in Ireland per year and then a few abroad as well. So um, you can keep your eye out on my social media pages and my website for the dates. Brilliant. Owen, thanks again. Um, absolutely brilliant. Um, I learned a lot and uh, great to see how really kind of taking that ability to, to zoom in on the shoulder, but then zoom out and look at the whole person again and um, how that's, that's very much uh, an evolving, but obviously a healthily growing concept um, in the world of physio. So I'll put a link to your uh, website at the bottom here and I'll also put it in the, the blog post that's going to go with this interview. So thank you again. Thanks very much, Michelle, and, and really love all the work you're doing, spreading the spreading the word of physiotherapy. <laughs> <Spreading> the gospel. <laughs> Thanks.